here in the area. Uh, so anyway, all the slides and links to everything I'm covering are up there. It's jsgeek.com slash nr. And I'll add a comment to the meetup page if everybody has it. So is anybody here using containers, using Docker or anything like Well, he's, yes, definitely, huh? Uh, are you using it in production too? Yeah, we use Kubernetes. Cool, awesome. Uh, is anybody else using containers at the moment? Uh, just straight up Docker or, yep, cool. So I was just curious what the trends are. I looked up um, the survey from Cluster HQ. Can you all, eh, might not be able to, I wonder if we can fix that. Is there any way we can make that darker? But anyway, the, uh, the respondents who were surveyed, 79% said that they're using containers in some way. So it doesn't have to be Docker, but just containers in general. And then 76% said that they're using containers in production. So a little less than everybody who's using containers. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's a little better. Uh, and then I looked at Docker survey from last year, and 90% of people said that they're using Docker, but only 58% said that they're using it in production. Uh, but the big takeaway seems to be with these surveys is that even though uh, they aren't using uh, like Docker in production, the trend is still going up from the previous year. This is a survey of Java developers. Only 22% said that they're using containers in production. And then if you go over to Node from last year, I don't know if you all have done the Node survey, but it's usually pretty helpful. If you're a member of the foundation, you should get a, a link to it. Anyway, Node developers, 45% said that they're using Docker. Uh, the Node survey didn't ask you know, if you're using Docker in production, so it could be less in production. But why would you use containers? I don't know, why, why did you all choose to use Docker or containers in general? Anybody? <laughs> Awesome, yeah. So you get the immutable images. It's easier to kind of move around between different environments. Yeah. Yeah, yep, exactly. Uh, it, another reason that some people listed is exactly what you said, just more developer efficiency. Developers can now start doing more devops -y type jobs. Uh, and then it's also more performant than just a VM because you're using operating system level virtualization. Um, but surprisingly, I, you know, I've, I've brought this up, but a lot of people aren't using it because of that reason, which is, I don't know. <laughs> is anybody using containers for performance reasons? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was curious about just the performance difference between a VM versus just operating system level virtualization with a container. So I did a, a very dumb benchmark of all the main uh, main frameworks for Node. So Express, Total, Koa, Happy, Restify. Uh, don't compare them to each other, but the main difference is just how they compare to themselves versus uh, whenever they're on a hardware versus a VM. So this is request per second, and they're all on the same operating system, same version of Node, same uh, data center and everything. But you can see the difference between running on a VM versus on the metal. It's, I don't know, about 45% difference, just request per second. So who all is using microservices? Yeah. <laughs> you, yeah, you all have a pretty good gig then. Yeah. Are you using it in production? Yeah. yeah. That seems to be the trend. Uh, it, it seems like it's easier to actually get 
microservices into production than just containers and Docker in general. Well, smaller. It's smaller. It is easy. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, so I looked at you know the usage of microservices, and I looked at an Nginx survey from last year, and they said 68% of people are using microservices in some way or another. And on that Cluster HQ survey, they indicated that a lot of people are choosing Docker and containers to support a microservices architecture, since they kind of go hand in hand in some ways. Uh, so. Why would you choose microservices? Well, if you're already in the Unix world, uh, it aligns pretty well with that. You know, do one program well, and if you need to add a new feature, don't just create a new program. <laughs> it, you know, create things that are disposable, uh, be able to iterate quickly. Those are some other advantages. Is there any particular reason why you guys chose to go microservices? <laughs> yeah. We found that a lot of clients had the same exact use cases, but we would select the instance where we had, or we had some data that was separate, so we had to take a different tree set. And eventually, very recently, we decided to make a series of microservices that created a common task and feed it off from there so we could stop building that. And most of our services, most of our project now is just a series of piece of feed requests that do the one thing we need to do and chain them together and you're done. You don't have to worry about yeah. Have you? Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, this is an awesome question because the the definition is so blurred at this point because if you go ask any large co uh, like company, they're all going to say, yeah, we're doing microservices. And then you get down to it and maybe they just have like a team that's des designated to like the user service, right? Uh, and there's not even like, there's not a national, like NIST hasn't come out with a formal definition yet. They have some working draft of a definition. <laughs> My definition is probably going to vary from others, but mine would be like the the reward that you're expecting to get out of a microservice is that you're able to spin it up in a week, like develop it in a week, or an, or an iteration. But I like to confine that to like a week, so that because everybody has different sprint lengths, you know. That's my definition. Anything that you can spin up, develop in a week. Yeah, yeah, it could. It depends on the complexity of it all in the end. But I, I think you're you're trying to make a, a service or set of services that you can tear down and replace easily. So if you make the wrong choice with the direction you went, you know that week or last week, you can change that direction next week. But it depends on who you ask. <laughs> I don't know. Any any other variant? Yeah. Yeah, I, no, no, I, I, I mean, that's definitely one big perspective on it. Uh, Sam Newman the, was the person who wrote the, the big microservices book, and that's kind of his definition, more of, you know, like a service that a team, a small group of people can maintain. So it is, it kind of confines the size or the scope of that, you know, service, I suppose. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Netflix is all micro, yeah. So, um, good idea. on the organization front, as, as I said, a great example. Uh, Bezos for Amazon basically told all the teams they must approach all problems moving forward like that. And the essence of product of that is the $5 billion a year AWS web 
infrastructure. And I mean, basically, just by designing your infrastructure that way, gives you the ability to quickly pivot to new business or new kind of um, use cases that you would have never dreamt of before with your model of structure. Yep. Uh, I can speak, uh, well, no, I'll just leave it at that. That's, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I was going to bring up Walmart, but that's that's a whole other thing. Well, I've heard a few people say that they use it specifically to be able to bring in some large stack overall to let the students go crack. So they don't want to add no more like particle magnetic. They want to use like some new version or whatever. And all of that, for instance, I don't know, there's two things. A lot of companies have a bunch of two servers. They want to use like three five. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, I guess the big trend now is like digital transformation. We're moving from uh, the old legacy to the new. That's, yeah, uh, kind of with that. Um, so yeah, people sometimes will do like a reverse proxy or something and start feeding off to the new service instead of uh, sending everything to the old. Do the, I think, Strangler, Strangler pattern? Is that kind of what you're, is that, well, yeah, I don't know what you're, yeah, just a, yep, uh, yeah, all, all, <laughs> everything seems to like fall under microservices, uh, even though, you know, it's like supposed to be this really tiny thing, but I'm kind of like going off on a, a tangent here on microservices, but I do think they align very well with containers where you're trying to, with containers, especially Docker, your images are immutable. You're able to throw them or tear them down and stand them up very quickly. You're able to move fast. Um, and I think the compose file, like Docker compose is a, is a nice artifact for describing a set of microservices. And then I, I kind of wanted to tie this back into Node because I like Node so much. Uh, but I think Node also goes well with, if you're going to choose microservices and containers, it's very tiny. Like the code you write should be pretty small and there's a huge number of small modules out there you can use. You could even say, I don't know if I want to stretch it and say like, those are microservices, they're not. but. <laughs> But you get where I'm going with it. Uh, yeah, and especially with microservices, you have so many of them, the, the sync IO uh, development style of Node lends itself well to just calling out to all these different endpoints from different disparate services and bringing them together. So yeah, I, I think they go well together. Are you using Node for the microservices and all yeah. that? Yeah. yeah. That makes sense. Oh, I, I don't know about on uh, AWS, but on ours, it's all on the metal. We're using, we've been using containers for over a decade, but They've been Solaris or Lumos, like zones, so it's all on the on the metal, but they're containers. Uh, it's so Triton is the the name of the the stack that manages it all, but we have an on-prem solution. We have a public cloud. You can run it. Yeah, you can run it privately. It's all open source. I'll I'll try to talk more about that in a little bit. But, but yeah, metal. I like metal. If you're gonna choose Node for speed anyway, that's I don't know. That's my perspective on it. Uh, but as you go through Docker and just microservices in general, you might run into some pitfalls. The first one in Docker land that you may not know about is when you start up your Docker container, 
that process is going to be running as PID1, which is usually where you have your init process. So it actually, that process should know how to behave like an init process, know how to reap uh, like zombie processes and, and start up. If you have more than one process, start it up. There are some solutions. There's tiny, dumb init, and my init. So if you're going down the Docker road, definitely look into a init solution. Another potential pitfall with Docker, there's not any like well-defined lifecycle hooks. So when your container is about to shut down, you won't get like a notification to, that it's about to shut down, and you may need to go clean up, you know, like some data or finish writing data, so you don't have any, um, you know, bad data <laughs> sitting around. Uh, another one is the depends on and links, which are used to, you know, like indicate like, this service depends on this other service. So start up that other service first before you start me. Uh, that actually won't do any health checking. It just will start, you know, start that process and then come start my other process. So it, it's not super reliable if you need like a database to be running, you know, healthy before you actually connect to it. So just keep that in mind. You have to build that resiliency into your application to, to try reconnecting, for example. And then a couple of microservices pitfalls that I consider somewhat of a pitfall. Well, if you're using microservices, you might end up doing a load balancer where you might have like user.stage and then all your user services behind that. Uh, and as you add out tons and tons of services, you'll have more of those names and more configuration to manage. So you just have to make sure you do the, the due diligence and have a good plan in place on how to manage that configuration. Because I don't know, I've, I've deployed to production pointing to QA before, so <laughs> I don't know if anybody else has done that, but as you add more services, it's just more likely to occur. And then if you're using a load balancer, usually you'll have a health endpoint that you have to expose, right? To, so the load balancer can see if your service is healthy and route traffic to it. Uh, potential kind of edge case here is if you're doing a lot of work on that endpoint and it happens to get exposed publicly, it could DOS that service. So a solution to those problems is a free open source product we have called Container Pilot. It's all written in Go, unfortunately. Not, not Node, but everything is written in Go these days, it seems like, especially in container land. Uh, but it follows something we call the autopilot pattern, which is really trying to, trying to go with the, the original cell of Docker and containers where you should be able to move from one environment to another. Like you should be able to develop on your laptop and have that environment pretty much mirrored in production so you can reproduce issues. Um, yeah, and you also hopefully shouldn't be married to a specific infrastructure. So you want to be able to port your Docker from one cloud to another, from on-prem to the cloud. So those are the main goals for the autopilot pattern. Um, and um, if you want to read more about it, you can go to autopilotpattern.io. And we have quite a few applications at this, at this point written in container pilot and impl implementing the autopilot pattern. So we have Mongo, MySQL, Influx, Console, Jenkins. We have WordPress if you wanted to spin that up as a good working example. So container pilot, it does quite a bit of stuff actually. So it runs as PID1 and it'll do all the reaping and starting up your process just like an init process should. It'll do health checks if you want it to uh, on your services. Uh, that'll be contained within the container itself, so it doesn't have to be exposed publicly. Um, it also, something that I really like about it, it'll watch for any changes in any dependencies your service has or your application has. So if you're dependent on like a database and another instance of that database comes up, like you have a, a couple of them that you need to pull up, 
it'll notify your application that there's a new running database. And it does that through console. So is anybody using console or etcd or console? Yep. Uh, so we were supporting with container pilot, etcd, and console, but we found like nobody used etcd. So in this next version, we're kind of scrapping that. Uh, so console is a service discovery like catalog is really what it is. It, okay, perfect. <laughs> it also has a key key value store as well, but we're using it mostly for the service discovery aspect. So it just keeps a list of you know like what the healthy addresses and ports are for a particular service. Uh, so container pilot three is almost out and. If you're interested in like what the features are, if you want to provide feedback, we do all of our stuff in the open. So if you go to like the joint org on GitHub and slash RFD, you can find all of our plans for Triton, Container Pilot, and everything. But RFD 86 is what talks about Container Pilot 3. But we're going to marry ourselves completely to console, and that's going to allow us to do uh, better. Um, like the depends on problem, that's gonna go away. Like we'll be able to start up your process after everything it depends on is healthy. Yep. Which is pretty fancy, pretty cool. So we use console like health check and then heart or watch to watch for the dependencies. And this is the uh, container pilot. Man, can you all see that okay? That's a uh, yeah. So this is just the life cycle for your container on Container Pilot. So you get a couple of life cycle hooks or events. So you have pre-start, on change, and post start. So post start is intended to like allow you to clean up anything you need to. So we do a pre-start, get all the background or backend addresses that your service cares about. And then after that, if you have health checks configured, we'll do health checks and then send a heartbeat to console to let it know that your service is healthy. And anytime any of your services that you care about change, we'll notify you. So to kind of describe this better, I created a, a node example application that you can, you can pull down if you want. Uh, it's under the autopilot pattern org node.js example. But this is the diagram, architectural diagram for it. So it's pretty simple. Um, it might go well with your I IoT uh, hackathon, maybe. I don't know. So I'm using uh, SmartThings Hub. Does anybody use SmartThings at all? It's uh, just like an IoT hub for your home that works over Z-Wave, connects to any Z-Wave device or Zigbee device. So that's smart things up, anyway. <laughs> uh, so I have a multi-sensor connected to the smart things, and that detects things like humidity, motion, light, temperature. And I have that data sent into a smart things service, is what I'm calling it. And then that just feeds into these three tiny kind of worker microservices, you might call them, that just pull the data from that smart thing service and push it into a serializer service that then saves everything to Influx. And then we have a simple front end that displays the graph, uh, the, the data as a graph. And everything's connected to console. In the future, I'm gonna, have you uh, used NATS at all, anybody? It's another messaging queuing server instead of like Rabbit or Kafka. So I don't know. That's that's the next version. I'm gonna probably put like a queuing, uh, just a queue between the smart things and all the workers. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> so the modules I'm using, I'm using Happy, Seneca, uh, and then Piloted, which is one I wrote just to work with Container Pilot. So Piloted will talk to console for you. So it makes it easy to query the services you care about. And it'll also round robin if you want it to, round robin those services. So 
say, give me user. If you call it again, it'll give you the next user service. And then rec, uh, you guys might use request. Rec is the one I wrote, and it's maybe maybe better in some ways. So <laughs> if you're in the happy land, that's that's uh, that's our request replacement. So let me just I'll spin this up so you can see what the front end looks like. Uh, I don't have a smart things hub, so on that smart things service, I'm just generating dummy data. But does anybody have any questions before I start this up? Or kind of kind of jumped into a lot of stuff there real quick. <laughs> so, is who here is not familiar with Docker? Uh, okay, so Docker Compose. Uh, well, I'll show you the Compose file, but it basically just describes all the services that you need to bring up. Uh, and then up, and then detached mode, it'll start all these containers for me, and it'll map the ports, expose the ports that I need. Uh, let's see what the Yahoo News is. Ooh. Is that potentially too big? It might be okay. So this is the console dashboard, so you can see the health checks for all the services, and you can see the number of services I have running. And then this is the front end. So I'm using rickshaw graphs, which is maybe an older <laughs> front end client. Uh, has anybody used rickshaw before? It's uh, so I have it connected to a happy server through WebSockets, so you get the full updates whenever there's new data coming in. Nothing crazy. Uh, yeah, e just the receiver. So, yeah. So those are the. Let's see. We have the the smart things is the one that's generating the data, and then temperature, motion, and humidity are just pulling that data into the serializer or sending it over. And it's connected between smart things and those jobs. That's using Seneca, and then I'm just using Rack to send make requests to the serializer. Uh, the cool thing, though, is since everything is connected with Container Pilot and with Console, I can start scaling things out and scaling things down. So I can add a serializer, a couple serializers. Uh, if I bring the humidity down to zero, so drop or kill that container, the graph should stop flowing, yeah. Uh, if you go back to console, should get more, more serializers. We have six now, well, six health checks. It's two per container. Uh, and then I can start that back up start up the humidity sensor again, and it will start flowing. So probably the more interesting thing is like, how does that, <laughs> how is it responsive to the changes? So container pilots watching console uh, for the services you care about. Let me, yeah, so this is the sensor, which is the humidity temperature uh, container. And this is the container pilot configuration. So I can specify I care about the serializer and smart things. So anytime there's a change, if there's a new smart things or serializer, or one goes away, notify my process. So the way I'm notifying the process is sending it a SIG up signal. You can change that to however you want. Um, it's not restarting the process, it's just sending that signal. Uh, and then piloted is just watching or listening for that signal. And then it's going to call out the console with a request for give me all the, the updated list of healthy addresses for that, that service. Any questions on any of that? Or? Uh, it'll work across any number of Docker hosts, as long as they can talk to the same console cluster, essentially, and talk to each other. But yeah, that, no, as long as they can talk to that console, console instance. 
And all the load balancing is basically done in the, the application itself now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's part of the Docker. You could go with uh, like Kubernetes, or or you could use like Triton. We'll do it for you. Uh, yeah, we don't we don't solve that problem. <laughs> that's a bigger problem. Uh, this just takes care of more of the res uh, just being able to respond to the changes in your in the different apps and try to simplify the the number of things that you'd have to provision. So now you don't have to provision a load balancer, for example. Uh, it should also help simplify like your environments. Now you could have like like your QA and production could be maybe in the same data center but have different console clusters that they actually talk to. And everything just is communicated through that. Uh-huh. Yeah, for the most part, it, so right now I'm just talking to my local Docker host, and so it'll just provision it in that host only. Uh, but if you needed to scale scale out more with like Kubernetes, uh, do you have a better answer on? I on think that, that there is no. This is the exact way you can do it. Yeah. Like there are just, just a lot of people trying different things. I don't personally know what the answer is. I've seen a lot of people claim that their answer is the answer, and then everyone tear it down. So right now, I would say that the answer is work with a couple of different ones, find the one that fits your workflow right now, because there is no king of the castle yet. Yeah, and it also depends on where you're going to deploy to. Like if you're going to go to Google Google Cloud, they seem to have pretty good Kubernetes support. Uh, oh, they really? Yeah. I don't know how, do they support, are you on that, or on yeah, Google Cloud? We're on a different service called Discovery that supports Kubernetes support. And then our own servers, so it's a weird set. Cool. Yeah, I mean, we, so, uh, I, yeah, we, so we implement, like, the, the Docker API on our cloud, so it make it easy to deploy using Docker. So we are always looking at newer versions of Docker. Uh, well, Docker but, and everything else you have inside. Oh, so, yeah, I, I don't know, we don't really, uh, like, audit or anything like that for a container. We don't have a solution for that. Um, Everyone has its own isolated system. Like the VMs, the containers, it comes down to you have to have your trust somewhere or you're going to have the developers that you hire to hold it down. You have to trust the container for it. And that's just on what risk are you willing to put forward for your business versus how much money you're willing to spend. Like we trust the no container, the default no container from Node.js uh, funding. It's a very trustworthy container. I don't have the manpower or time to go and check it. So I'm just going to trust it to do a good job. And that's just the decision that we have to make as a business and as a developer. So, yeah, there's always going to be something out there that's going to bite you in the butt, but you can't possibly check everything. Things are too complicated these days. So that's Yeah, and there's vendors popping up, especially in Docker land. Uh, I've seen one that has like an agent running in the container. So you basically, the, the company would have a base image where everybody gets an agent and then that 
checks to make sure that the whatever is running in the container is not trying to get out of the container for the most part. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I think a base image seems to be uh, probably what a lot of companies will do. Is it, it's kind of the same, I guess, with uh, the NPM registry, right? I don't know. Most people will probably move into an internal registry or private registry. They also have the tools to check. I forget what they call it, but it's the authorized registry where they do the scanning. I forget what they call it, though. The, the one from NSP or? No, or uh, oh, Node Source? Yeah, they had a, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they're, they're doing a, like, we have checked this node module kind of service. I wonder what their guarantee is if you find a bug in their, yeah. in their. <laughs> like, hold on, buddy, there's 400,000 bugs. Yeah. <laughs> we, we reduced the pile of crap. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, there's ways to go. That, that's a good way to go, I guess. Um, So does anybody want to see any of the, the node code and how this is done, or is that inter Okay. Awesome. Uh, it's super opinionated. I, I would say it depends on your organization and your team size. So we designed Happy to be, to work well with more than one person. <laughs> Coding it. So we don't have like the middleware pattern. We have plugins, and you can't really violate other people's plugins in the server. So we we were working under under the pressure of okay, we're going to have these different teams deploying routes like handlers to the same server. So let's make it so that nobody can overwrite their each other's routes, and plugins play nicely. So we did that, and then we also have pretty well-defined uh, request lifecycle hooks. So you know exactly like authentication. Uh, yeah. If you only care about that, you have your hook for that. If you only care about handling a cookie, you have your hook for that. I don't know. <laughs> Depends on your use case, really, though. Like an event. An event for a well-defined event. I don't know. It, I mean, a lot of people are using Express. A lot of people use Restify. We use Restify quite a bit at, at Joint for most of our APIs. Uh, well, I've seen different approaches. A lot of people are moving to like an API gateway, basically, where everything from the public or private is funneled through like Kong, Kong is one. There's traffic, I think is another. Yeah, and yeah. It all depends on which way you're hitting it, I suppose, but yeah. I don't know, are you all doing an API gateway or? Yes, but it's a little weird, so can't recommend it. Is <laughs> Completely private, but uh, cool. that's how we do it. Everything funnels through one central point that then figures out, are you allowed to talk to this thing? And we, we actually do. Yeah. Uh, I think that's probably the way to, the way things are going. Uh, oh yeah, node code. So, let's see. Mm -hmm. Index may be more interest, or uh, not index, the serializer may be more interesting. So whenever I design this, I try to go under the assumption that nothing will be started whenever this starts, or things can be brought down whenever this is still running. So I have an in-memory, very crude, like saving data if uh, the database is down. And then when the database comes up, I'll just flush all that data. Uh, again, this is just like temperature humidity data, so it's not very important, even if it didn't get there. But. 
Yep, absolutely. So the whole everything is on GitHub under autopilot autopilot pattern, and all the links are at that first link I sent. Um, if you're using Happy, uh, I did create this nice little plugin called Brule. Are you guys familiar with Dr. Brule? <laughs> check it out. So yeah, exactly. Dr. Brule, uh, this is my, my health check. And it's check it out is the endpoint. And he replies with, if he's healthy, he'll reply with, I don't know, what does he reply with? <laughs> Just random Dr. Brule sayings. Uh, so yeah, I have a couple of routes for getting data and then reading data out. Um, and then the, the piloted part, let's see. So anytime uh, there's an update, we have this event refresh. And now I'll go set up the DB and call out to pilot it again to get my updated list of healthy uh, databases to connect to. So let me get to the. Uh, so yeah, here I call out to piloted service. Give me the the next address for Influx server. And if you didn't want to use the the round robin, you could call like all services, and it'll give you a, the full list of hosts. So that's that's essentially all it's doing for the uh, handling that you know those changes in console because container pilot will watch console for me. It also will register my service with console. I don't really have to do much except, hey, give me the list of healthy addresses for this service. It, it's just querying the input and then, or the endpoint. Um, yeah, if you look at the, the Docker file, I do have uh, the console agent running within the container. I like doing that, but you can make that optional if you want. So yeah, this is this is all it's doing. Start from the Alpine version of Node, Alpine Distro, and then copy over console and container pilot, copy over the configurations, install my dependencies, and then you can see the actual command to start is just container pilot and container pilot will start up my node process which I have configured here. So it'll register the serializer with console for me at the port and then it'll do my health check. Check it out. What are you using to replace the support for templating? Oh, so this is, uh, it's using Go templates. Which, have you done any Go, like the Go templates? Oh my gosh. <laughs> Makes you miss like mustache and actual templating. Uh, it does some things, but not all the things that you need. But it works well for simple uh, environment variable replacement and things like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Any questions on, or anything else that you all want to see as far as code goes? It, it, it supports promises. Yeah, we had to give in to that, that camp. Because, I don't know, you can't really say, like, no, no this way, no that way. You can, but it's not nice. <laughs> There's a lot of people who use promises. And a lot of people use callbacks. Like, Influx, their, uh, their library changed to only promises, which... How do we asynchronous support in Happy? Uh, we haven't moved everything over to that. I mean, we're, we support promises. So you could write your your handlers using that style. But I guess that's not LTS yet either. Yet. Should be soon though, right? November? I think it was 7. Yeah, because eight, eight's around the corner. That's good, yeah.
thing before we go to production is, is uh, Hegel's Law. You know, we're going to put it out there next time. So. Well, I think I found our next talk for this one. A think away? Yeah, but yeah, eight, eight's around the corner. That might be a good, like, async await plus what's new in eight. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, are you all interested in me pushing this to production real quick? Yeah. All right, sweet. <laughs> so Triton, here, let me, let me back up here. Go back to the slides. So Triton is the name of our stack that manages our cloud and everything. Oh, I was like, what did that say? <laughs> so it's open source and it's mostly written in Node. So are you all familiar with Joint? And like, we brought in Node for the most part. We hired Ryan Dowell and and went all in on Node uh, back in like 2010, 2009 timeframe, whenever right after Node came out. But anyway, we went all in on Node and we're a cloud company. And so we ended up building out most of our cloud tooling and our full cloud stack using Node. So everything in green is written in Node. And that's all of Triton right there, all the different agents and services. Uh, so Ryan Dahl, no, no. He's <laughs> He, he moved on to, I don't know exactly what he's doing at the moment. There you go, AI. That's where he is. <laughs> uh, so anyway, it, it makes, uh, so as I was saying before, we implemented the, the Docker API uh, on, on our existing uh, Triton stack there. So we had a cloud API where you could provision new machines and things like that. We have the Docker API implemented. So now a data center is basically a Docker host. Yeah, pretty cool. And well, let me deploy to production and show you. <laughs> it's actually very simple since, especially if you're already familiar with uh, the Docker tooling so I already set my environment variable, but uh, let's see. So all I had to do is change my Docker host to point to the data center I cared about. So I'm pointing to our Southwest One data center and point it to my certificate. And now I am basically pointing at the API we have implemented there. And I can use all the Docker commands I'm used to using. So I can do up, which I already did. Uh, I can see what's running, PS. I can do logs, all that jazz. I can scale, so if I wanted to add more serializers, I can do the same, same commands I was using locally in development. And the nice thing is each of those containers, it's all running on the metal, first of all. Every one gets its own uh, vNIC, and so you don't have to worry about like port port mismatch or port collision. Like if you're running locally, you know, you only have a port that <laughs> you can open up for one one container. So scaling, if you're using that same port, like if you're published to the same port, can be difficult. Anyway. <laughs> uh, so let me get the IP for the front end. And it's a public IP since it saw that I had a, a port that was published. So it needed knew that it needed to have a public IP. And I'm now listening on uh, port 80. So same thing running in production. Same tooling had to be used. Uh, but the cool thing, since this is all running on, the, uh, on SmartOS, you have all the debugging tools that SmartOS and Solaris Lumos have. Has anybody done any Solaris or Lumos or? Yeah, so you know, you know all about it. It's a, uh, so, you know, there was a split. Um, 
a fork, if you will, and a Lumos was the, the fork name. So there's a good talk by Brian Cantrell called Fork Yeah, <laughs> talking about the, the split there. Um, yeah, but anyway, you can, uh, even though I'm using Linux, I can still get access to Dtrace and all of the Unix -y debugging tools. So I can run a shell on my front end that's running there in the data center. Oops. Uh, so all the standard, standard folders are there. I also have another folder called native, which is where we put Dtrace. So this is running Linux. Uh, and then we're using LX branded zones. So Linux branded zones on top of uh, yeah, on top of the metal there. So the Linux syscalls and then translate it down to the Lumos syscall or SmartOS syscall. But anyway, let me set my path to point to all the cool native tooling. Now I can do, let's see, did you ever use like, uh, well, let me do, see what the port number or the, so. That's my PID. Did you ever use any of the P tools? So this is the, the open files for the node process that's running right now. So that would include, you know, open sockets, open actual files. You, let's see, P stack is a good one. You also have access to like G core, so you can do postmortem debugging. So you can drop a core file and then go check it out after the incident occurred. Then you have dtrace, so we can list the uh, probes for the, for the PID provider. So those are all the, the probes that are available to me. Yeah, so this is using, it's running Linux, right? Your, this is your doc, the Docker container, uh, and it's running on LX branded zones. So Linux branded zones on top of SmartOS. So whenever you deploy your, uh, your Docker container, we realize, hey, that's a Docker container, but we'll mount this native path for you with dtrace and everything. Since under the hood, SmartOS, yep. Yeah, so there you go. Even though you didn't have to actually install anything in, in your container, you have access to dtrace, uh, which is nice. I've had to use this in production to debug some stuff. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Any questions on any of that? Like, it's pretty sweet <laughs> if you think about what's going on there. Uh, but yeah, we also support KVM, so if you want to run Windows or you know, anything in a VM, you can. <laughs> but if you just want you know, raw speed, I don't know. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, virtual mix for each of the containers. Uh, no, that's more just the on the Unix side, so that's, that's how we do like the, the IP addresses and things like that. Uh, yeah, so. Yeah, so these are, well. Yeah, exactly. So we read that, uh, that compose file and then we'll set up the firewall rules for you and expose like if you have that mapping, we'll expose that port. And generate, and generate everything, yep. Generate all the firewall rules. So so in here, let's see. So yeah, all the ports, th those will be public ports because they're published. But if you just expose a port, it'll set up the firewall rules so that the containers can talk to each other. And the other cool thing is, like in Compose, you can also specify memory limits and CPU limits. So we'll read that and provision you, you know, something that's close to that size of a container so you're not using more than you need. And again, this is, 
it's open source, uh, and you can run it on-prem and in the cloud if you want, yeah, in our public cloud. It's fun now. Yeah. A any questions on anything I've covered? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah, and if, if you go back to that survey from Docker, 90% of people say they're using Docker, and then only it was like 60% are in production with it so for that reason. Yeah, I mean, here you go. You just point your, we try to make it easier for you. You just point your Docker host to our data center, any of our data centers. Do you have a question? Yeah. Yeah, you can go, uh, like we have a free trial if you wanted to just try out Triton, $250 credit. Uh, so you can host it in our public cloud there, or you can do it on-prem. Uh, Oh yeah, just it's something that comes with using Join as your cloud provider. Uh, yeah, and we're expanding our, so uh, Samsung bought us, <laughs> ah, not Triton Samsung, but we're expanding our data centers. So this is our current list. Uh, but yeah, we're adding more. Yeah, if you want us to host for you, yep. Exactly, yep. Yeah, pretty simple. And then we also have uh, Manta, which is our object store competitor there for us instead of S3. Uh, yeah, but so yeah, all the links are there. I'll, I'll add a, a comment. Um, check out Container Pilot though; it's pretty, pretty cool. And then, again, you can run this on any, anywhere. You can run Docker. You can run Container Pilot. So Autopilot. And then you can see all the other implementations. Yeah, we're trying to make it very vendor neutral too. So, not trying to tie you to any particular cloud at all. And we actually just did a blog post on how to run Kubernetes on uh, on Triton if you're interested in that. But yeah, any any other questions? Yeah. It, I wrote it, so it's pretty pretty basic. 
it's just a round robin. So, but uh, so in the sensors, I'm also just doing a random balance. So just give me a random host in this list, which can be useful. So it's a, it's up to you really on how you want to do it. Well, so we have uh, a few databases implemented. Web app. Oh, your web app. Uh, so. Yeah. So you're talking about the load balancing of it? Yeah, and in that way, you'd probably want to have a load balancer in the actual front end to do that that type of, you know, keep your session sticky or whatever. Uh, but the balancing between the different microservices, it's completely up to the services themselves on how they how they want to do that. Is that? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, so there is a web admin, uh, my.join.com, with a dashboard. And you can also run Triton on your laptop. We have a VMware image you can download. It's called uh, Coal Cloud on a laptop. So if you just wanted to spin it up locally, you can do that. All, all Triton, and then you can start, you know, pushing Docker to it if you want. And just try it locally instead of the, the very simple Docker host, and you can provision like Windows VM on it if you want <laughs> in your VM. VM layers. Yeah, so through the dashboard or in our API, we have cloud API, which would allow you to add in uh, different metadata like that. And that's something where the, the secrets management, something we're trying to expand on right now. So we have lots of work that we're, we're doing to add more features and things like that. Like but Yeah, and and we do have a uh, a basic key value store like that, or you'd probably want to use like Vault or uh, another you know secrets service kind of kind of solution. Yeah. yeah. Well, thanks for coming out, everybody. And am I out of time there? All right. Well, got any other questions? I'll Yeah, that's the cool thing that Docker actually gives you. So yeah, there's an affinity option, and then we'll honor that. So affinity, <laughs> if I can spell it right. But it's in the compose option. Yeah, I haven't used it, but it is there, and I know we do honor honor that. So yeah, if two services need to uh, be located next to each other, you can say that. Yep. Yeah, I'm surprised with some of the features in Compose. Yep. Yeah, and it also makes like your your CI, your Jenkins very simple. It's like compose up. <laughs> Down. Yeah. Uh, Well, thanks for having me.